أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا شهيد كربلاء فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين ونمكن لهم في الأرض صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى has sent prophets and messengers to establish the religion of God to show us the path to the Almighty God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent successors or Imams who protect those religions. The role of the messengers, the universal messengers, is to deliver a new faith to the people, to deliver a new set of laws to the people. The role of an Imam the role of a successor is to preserve that faith, to protect that faith. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, what was their most important goal? To bring us a new message? A new faith? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the final religion with our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned the Imams of Ahlul Bayt to preserve the religion for us, to save the religion for us, to show us how to practice this religion. We learn our values when it comes to implementing the religion from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They show us how to worship the Almighty God. They give us so many beautiful lessons when it comes to implementing the message that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, gave to us. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is no exception. When you examine his life, you find that his main role was to preserve the religion, to save the religion of God. He teaches you how to worship God, how to be free, how to be brave, even how to forgive your enemy. We learn these lessons from the Imam alayhi salam. Now when Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, when he left Medina and he wanted to continue his journey to Iraq, he made it very clear what his goal was. He says, I have left 
to seek reform in the nation of my grandfather. I want to bring justice. The corruption that you see, the deviation that you see, I want to resist that, to combat that. The Imam السلام, his revolution is based on justice. Physically, Imam al Hussein السلام, was killed on the day of Ashura. However, his blood survived, his message survived. And that journey which he began continues. And it continues at the hands of his grandson, the Imam of our time, Al Imam Al Mahdi Ajallahu Ta'ala Faraja. What is the goal of our 12th Imam? To establish justice on earth, just as it is filled with injustice. He will continue the same mission. He will continue the same message. He will continue the same journey. The Imam of our time is in occultation, in ghayba. He is absent from our eyes physically. There are a number of reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had our 12th Imam in occultation. A number of reasons, there are many wisdoms behind it. One is to test us, because the most difficult test is to believe in the ghayb, in the unseen. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ He represents the unseen, the belief in the unseen. One is to discipline us. God sent us 11 gems, 11 stars of Ahlul Bayt, 11 shining stars. What happened to them? One after the other, they were killed. They were massacred. They were poisoned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved this last one. So we appreciate the leaders whom God appoints for us. Another reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the Imam in occultation is for us to achieve completion so we can prepare ourselves for His reappearance. It's an opportunity for us to work on ourselves during the time of ghaybah during the occultation and the absence of the Imam. One other important reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the Imam in occultation since he was young, according to a number of traditions and hadiths, is that there would be no bay'ah on his neck. For example, you have one hadith from the eighth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al-Imam Al-Rada salawatullahi alayhi. He says, my third grandson will go into occultation, into an absence, into a ghaybah, such that his followers will feel lost. You know, like a herd of sheep that is lost, doesn't know where to go, what to do. Then he mentions the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps him in occultation is so that there is no allegiance, there is no bay'ah in his neck. Now what does this mean? How do we understand this hadith that the Imam السلام, is in occultation? Because Allah did not want him to have any bay'ah on his neck when he re-emerges, when he reappears. For us to understand this, we have to know there are, there's two types of allegiance, two types of bay'ah, or two definitions to the bay'ah. The first definition is when you give allegiance to a ruler, you recognize his authority, you consider him as a legitimate ruler, and you promise to obey his rules and commands, and you see him as an extension of the Prophet. No Imam of Ahlul Bayt gave bay'ah in this sense, because it was clear from their lives that they did not recognize the legitimacy of those rulers. Look at the commander of the faithful, how he speaks in Nahj al balagha when he gave his famous sermon after he became the Khalifa, he says, those who came before me, they confiscated my right. They took my right when they had no justification to do so. They had no right to do so. What does this mean? If you are saying that those who came before you wrongly, unjustly took your right, 
That means you don't recognize them as legitimate leaders. Otherwise, how can you say that? Now, if you go to other books such as Sahih Muslim, Muslim mentions an interesting narration. He says, one day, Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, he came with Imam Ali السلام, during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. They came to him about some issue. Now when they came to him regarding that issue, Umar looks at them and he tells them, Abu Bakr narrated a hadith that the Prophet does not leave any inheritance after him. All the belongings of the Prophet is sadaqah, it's charity. Unlike other people who leave their belongings as inheritance, the Prophet has no inheritance. And I also to say, to say the same thing, that the Prophet, he did not leave any inheritance. Anything that he left is for the Ummah. Here's the important point. Then he looks at Imam Ali and Abbas and he says, however, you two see me and Abu Bakr as liars, as people who deceived and untrustworthy and disloyal. Who mentions this? Muslim in his book. So when you have the second Khalifa addressing Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, like that, that obviously shows you that he did not recognize them as legitimate rulers who represented the Prophet peace be upon him. So no Imam of Ahl al-Bayt gave allegiance in that sense. However, we see that the 11 Imams of Ahl al-Bayt for the sake of the religion of Islam and due to the circumstances of Taqiyya, they had to make an agreement with the rulers of their time that we will not call for an armed resistance against you. That's the agreement that we have. I will not call for a revolution against you for the sake of Islam, for the sake of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the life of the Imam. That happened even with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Not with Yazid, but with Muawiyah. Because Imam al Hussein alayhi salam continued the same agreement that his brother Imam al Hassan alayhi salam had made with Muawiyah. However, when it came to Yazid, things now became different. Yazid was a man who openly committed acts of injustice, immoral acts. He would drink publicly. Sometimes he would come on Wednesday, he was so drunk, he would pray the Friday prayer on Wednesday. He had made a complete joke out of the religion of Islam. He was destroying the religion of Islam from every angle. So the Imam السلام, he said, a man like me cannot even make an agreement with a man like Yazid. Because that will be the end of the religion of Islam, even if I make some sort of agree agreement with Yazid. When it comes to the 12th Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, what's different about him is that he made no agreement with any ruler, with any state, with any country, with any caliph. That's why when he re-emerges, when he reappears, no one can stop him and say, hey, you have an agreement with us not to resist us, to go with our system, not to call for an armed resistance. This is one reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept him in occultation so that he does not make an agreement with any ruler of his time such that when he reappears, he will call for this global revolution to take place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the Imam of our time in occultation for a number of reasons. Now many people wonder, what is the benefit of a hidden Imam? We have an Imam, but he's absent from us. What is the benefit of having an Imam that you have no access to? Does this benefit us in any way or no? There are a number of significant benefits of an absent Imam, of a hidden Imam. Knowing these benefits, knowing the role of the Imam السلام, will bring us closer to him, will give us that personal connection with him. And that helps us prepare for global justice. So that we become just at the individual level, at the family level, at the social level, and at the global level. Number one, when we try to understand the role of Imam al-Mahdi, number one, why did God create us in the first place? 
What does the Quran say? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I've not created the jinn or the people except that they worship me. So the real reason behind all of this creation is not to build a civilization. That's good, we should build a civilization. But that's not why God created us. God created us to worship Him, to worship the one God. That's the primary goal behind our creation. Now the one who fully worships God 100%, the way God wants is who? The one who possesses the full intellect, the one who is infallible, who worships God 100% according to the will of God. That's why in every era there's a hujjah, there's a proof of God on earth, whether it was a prophet or an imam. The one who represents that proof in our era is Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. He is the one who fully worships God. And by fully worshiping God 100%, by being infallible, by possessing the complete intellect, he validates the existence of the universe. Because Allah created the universe for what? To get to know Him, to worship Him. Who worships Allah the best way on earth? Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. You see that he validates the existence. Let me give you an example. Let's say you make a school, and your goal for this school is to have at least one student who graduates you know, with a 4.0, and who gets a 1600 on the SAT. Let's say that's your goal. Someone who's established a school, that's your goal. Now out of all the students who come, they learn, many of them get good grades, some of them fail. There is one student who gets that 1600. You've achieved your goal, and that validates your school. Even if this one person is not known, even if the other students don't know him, they don't recognize him. But you, the one who created the school, because your goal was for someone to get 1600 on the SAT, and only one student was able to achieve that, that validates your school. Otherwise, if you don't have that one single student who got the 1600 on the SAT, then you failed in your mission, right? Because from day one, your goal was what? To have at least one student ace the SAT. Al-Imam Al-Mahdi validates the existence because he's the one who fully worships God in every move that he makes. That's why you will find in Ziyarat Yaseen, what does the Imam السلام, say in describing Al-Imam Al-Mahdi? He says, As-salamu alayka heena taqoom. Peace be upon you when you stand up. Assalamu alayka heena taqud. Peace be upon you when you sit down. Assalamu alayka heena taqra'u wa tubayyin. Peace be upon you when you speak. When you recite the Quran. When you do the qunut. When you do the ruku'ah. When you do the sujood. Peace be upon you at night. Peace be upon you during the day. Why? Because in every single act, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi is worshipping God the way he wants himself to be worshipped. That's a very important role. Without Al-Imam Al-Mahdi on earth, there is no one who worships God 100%. Because he is the only infallible. And he validates this existence. Number two, in understanding the role of the hidden Imam, the presence of Al-Imam Al-Mahdi completes the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or in other words, the justice of God necessitates that there is a living Imam on earth. Why? Every human being, we have two internal forces acting upon us and two external forces. What are the two internal forces? One of the internal forces that you have is a nafs al ammara right? The evil inciting soul, your desires, your temptation. What is the role of the soul? It takes you to the path of deviation. It makes you sin. It pulls you 
to wrong temptations. That's what it does. It pulls the human being and it's very powerful. Our desires and temptations are very, very powerful. Now Allah is just. What has He given you to counter this evil inciting soul? What tool has He given you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped you with the power of the aql. Allah has given you the intellect. Yes, you have desires that are pulling you, but God has given you the power of reason. God has given you the intellect for you to decide right from wrong. So you see that balances out. That's the justice of Allah. These are two internal factors acting upon you. Now you have an external factor that's also acting upon you. Inside you have your nafs that's pulling you, right? From the outside, what is it that influences you to the path of misguidance, to sin, to disobey God? What is that force? Iblis, shaitan, the devil. We have many verses in the Holy Quran that speak about the devil, right? What is the role of the devil? To make you deviate. Now you have an external outside force that's whispering to you, that's inviting you to disobey God. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, right? If there's an external power on this earth that is physically present on this earth, that is whispering to you to go to the path of evil, doesn't the justice of God necessitate that, that there must be an external power as well, physically on earth, that invites you to the right path? Doesn't it necessitate it? What is that power? That's none other than in Imam al Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. Now, some will tell you, yeah, but I don't see the Imam. What's the point? Habibi, do you see the devil? Some of you may see the devil every once in a while. Some people themselves, there are many devils. But you don't see the devil physically. Do you see the devil physically? No. But you know it's there. You know that he whispers to you. Just like the devil whispers to you to misguide you. Don't you think that Imam al-Mahdi, who is the source of all guidance, can have a positive impact on you? When you pray to Allah, when you turn your face to Imam al-Mahdi, the devil has the power to whisper to you, but Imam al-Mahdi does not have the power to guide you. He doesn't have the power to guide you? Is the devil more powerful than the proof of God? Than the rep representatives of God? Now some people will ask me this question sometimes. They will say, Sayyid, we have some narrations in our books that Imam al-Mahdi examines our actions. Some hadith say on Thursdays, on Mondays, twice a week. All of the people on earth, the Imam salam examines our actions. He witnesses our actions. How is that possible? How is it one Imam he can witness the actions of seven billion people? That's you know just an exaggeration, that's idolization, that's ghulu. How can you say that? My response to that is to look at the opposite side. The devil, Iblis, which the Quran confirms, if you're a Muslim and you believe in the Quran, you believe in the existence of the devil, right? In Satan. The devil, does he see your actions or no? Not only does he see your actions, he can even read your mind, right? He can see your thoughts. Because if he doesn't see your intentions and thoughts, how is he going to whisper to you? You want to pay charity, the hadith says the, whis the devil comes, he whispers to you to change your mind. You want to pray the midnight prayers, the, the devil comes and he tries to change your mind, right? So he can see your intention. He can see what you're up to. Now subhanallah, the devil who's the enemy of God, whom God kicked out of paradise, the accursed enemy of God, he has the power to see the actions of seven billion people and read their minds. But the friend of God, the representative of God, who's chosen by Allah, who's been purified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he cannot witness your actions. He cannot see your actions. Allah gives a power to His enemy that He will not give to His own representative. There is no exaggeration in saying the Imam of our time witnesses our actions. 
So that's the second very important role of the Imam, is that he negates the power of the devil for those who turn to him. He is the source of all guidance, of all goodness on this earth. Another important role of the Imam alayhi salam is that through him we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us our needs through the Imam of our time. He has the power to intercede. أَيْنَ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ الَّذِي يَتَوَجَّهُ إِلَيْهِ الْأَوْلِيَاء As we recite in Dua and Nudba. Now some people will tell you, but you know what? I don't need any Imam to communicate to God. I don't need that God. I can communicate to Him directly. I can do Dua to Him directly. You've heard this all the time, right? My response to that, there's many responses to that, but I will leave it at this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to communicate with you and send you messages, how did He do it? Did Allah directly speak to you or He sent prophets and messengers and imams? Why couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly reveal in your heart the path of guidance? How come when it comes to Allah speaking to you, He went through Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, but when you want to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when you want to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're told, no, 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 don't mention Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Speak to Allah directly, pray to Him directly. The same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you the message through these infallibles, you also go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through those same infallibles. Yes, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our dua, our worship is solely for God. But through who? Through those gates which He has appointed. And the gate in our time is Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. Another role of the Imam is that when you know you have an Imam who's living, who prays for you when you turn to Allah, when you turn to Him. That gives you motivation. Imagine throughout history, how many efforts, how many groups, how many tyrants, how many governments sought to destroy the followers of Ahlul Bayt. How do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the followers of Ahlul Bayt until today and year after year you see them multiplying? How? Look at history and see what happened to the followers of Ahlul Bayt, to the lineage, to the grandsons of Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam During the time of Bani al-Abbas, on one night, during the time of Harun, on one night they killed 60 people from the line of Ali and Fatima. Look at history. In one of the villages of Syria centuries ago, they killed 20,000 of the followers of Ahlul Bayt in one night and they made pillars with their bodies. See what happened in history. How do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the nur of hidayah, the light of guidance in the hearts of the followers of Ahlul Bayt? It's through the Imam of the time, through his blessings, through his presence on earth. We have an Imam who's close to us. And I tell you, for the true believers, when you feel as if you've been orphaned from your Imam, you know that feeling of, of, of loss? When you lose something valuable. If you lose your child, God forbid. If you lose something that is valuable, can you sit still? You can't sit still. For the true believers, they have this feeling of constant loss, that I'm separated from my Imam. That feeling of loss makes them restless, and it makes them work day and night, and worship God day and night. Because you have this feeling of loss, you want to compensate for it. So you turn more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill this void that is created by this loss. There are many, many, many benefits to the hidden Imam, brothers and sisters, and the list continues. He is the Imam of our time. We turn to him and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten his reappearance. 
Now one thing that many people wonder about when we speak about the guided Mahdi, the 12th Imam of Ahlul Bayt, we know that one day he will reappear. This is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people wonder what are the sequence of events? How will the Imam reappear? In what circumstances? Where, in which area will he reappear from? Because when you familiarize yourself with the sequence of events, that keeps you better prepared. So that if in your lifetime you have the honor of witnessing the reappearance of the Imam, once you're familiar with the sequence of these events, that will bring you closer to the Imam of your time. Because there are people at that time who will have doubts. For them the truth may not be so clear. The sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt says, those who have a disease in their heart, when the Mahdi reappears, they will be confused. They will deviate. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts, so that when He reappears, we join Him. Let's look at the narrations of Ahlul Bayt. There are many narrations in this regard. And some of them give you slightly different details, but I will give you the bigger picture of what will happen based on a number of our traditions. One hadith that Abu Basir narrates from the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Al Sadiq, Salawatullahi Alayhi. He says the first of the definite signs that the reappearance of the Mahdi has drawn close is this that on the night of the 23rd of the month of Ramadan, in an odd year, not in an even year. So in the Islamic calendar, you're looking at an odd year. On a Thursday night, in the month of Ramadan, there will be a cry, a call in the skies. A call that every living soul will hear in their own languages. What does that call say? It will mention the name of our 12th Imam, whose name is the name of the Holy Prophet. It will mention his name, son of Al-Hasan, the Qa'im of Al-Muhammad has reappeared. So join him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Imam salam says, everyone in the world will hear this call. The one who's asleep will wake up. People in their homes, they will go out into their yards to see what's happening. Now the Imam describes who makes that call. He says, Jibra'il, the archangel of God, he is the one who announces this call. So now the whole world knows that it's time for the Imam to reappear soon. When this call is made, everyone, the whole world talks about the Mahdi. Where is the Mahdi? When will he reappear? Where is he now? And one hadith says, the love of the Mahdi will penetrate many hearts around the world. People will be so excited, they will be so eager, awaiting this final Savior. But at the same time, there will be enemies. For them, that's a disaster. Because they know that he will come and roll up their carpets of injustice and oppression. That's why the narrations indicate that you have a Sufyani. A Sufyani is this evil figure who will rule Syria. When he hears that the Mahdi is about to reappear, and there will be rumors that the Mahdi might possibly be in Medina. What does he do as Sufyani? He dispatches a huge army of 70,000 fighters to Medina. Go after this Mahdi and kill his supporters. The army of Sufyani arrives the holy city of Medina. The hadith says anyone they find with the name of Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein, they will slaughter them. It will be difficult times for the followers of Ahlul Bayt. For anyone who even has a connection with Ahlul Bayt, even if it's by their simple name. For three days they will ransack the city. They will destroy it just like Yazid ibn Muawiyah destroyed it after the massacre of Karbala. Now the Imam alayhi salam, at this time he's still hiding, but he's making some contacts with his very close companions, with the 313. 
The Imam alayhi salam is still in hiding at this time. Now Ramadan 23rd, the call is made. Sufyani dispatches his army. He dispatches another army to Iraq. Now what happens is on such a night, exactly like this time, on the night of Ashura, the ninth of Muharram at night, the Imam alayhi salam gathers the 313 companions in the city of Mecca. That's the beginning of his reappearance. One hadith from the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt says it will be a Friday night. He will gather his 313 companions. Among the 313 are 50 women. So women will join the Imam alayhi salam, not just men. So the 313, Allah will gather them all miraculously in Mecca. After Salat al-Asha, the eve of Ashura, the night of Ashura, the Imam alayhi salam prays two rak'ah by Maqam Ibrahim, then he stands by the Kaaba and he gives his first public speech. And the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have captured to us what the speech is. They've spoken about the words that he, he will say. And Imam Al Mahdi will stand by the Kaaba and he will make this public announcement. First of all, he will say, We have been oppressed throughout history. Our rights have been taken away from us. And we now seek the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this revolution. Now the night of Ashura is very significant brothers and sisters. Why, does, why would Allah choose such a night for the Imam to reappear? Because it signifies that Al Imam Al Hussein was killed on the day of Ashura, but his journey did not end. So on the night of Ashura, his grandson the Mahdi will continue that same journey. You see, subhanAllah, even the dates are truly amazing in how Allah will continue the message of Imam al Hussein. So he gives his speech, then he says, O oh people, there are many of you who will argue about God, we're on the right path, about Adam, about Nuh, about Ibrahim, about Musa, about Isa, about the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa about the Qur'an, about the religion of Islam, let me tell you, O world, that I am the closest to Allah, to Adam, to Musa, to Isa, to Ibrahim, and to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. I am the closest to the Qur'an. In Ziyarat Warith of Imam al Hussein, how does it start? Assalamu alayka ya waritha Adam safwatillah. If you want to know Al Imam Al Hussein, according to this ziyarah, you start with previous prophets. To know Aba Abdullah starts all the way from Adam. Because Al Imam Al Hussein salam, is the culmination of 124,000 prophets. He summarizes and represents 124,000 prophets. So Al Imam Al Mahdi in his speech, he says, I am the closest one to them. If anyone wants to dispute with me, argue with me, I am the closest to Allah, the closest to the path of the prophets, and I am continuing their path. Then he continues in his speech, and he says, O oh people, the Quran has been abandoned. Now it's the time to revive the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O oh people, come together to do acts of righteousness. Then he says, the world is now coming to an end. It's the end of times. We're getting closer to the day of judgment. And the world is about to farewell you. So take advantage of this opportunity to establish justice on earth. Then, O oh believers, according to the hadith, he will make five universal cries. What will he say? The first one, Ala ya ahl al alam, O oh people of the world. I am the Qa'im, the one who rises and stands. That's the first call. The second call, I am the avenger. I am the one who, seek, who will seek revenge for what? 
I will seek revenge for what happened to my grandfather Hussein. How will he seek revenge? By continuing the journey of Imam al Hussein. That's how I will seek revenge from the enemies. Because the enemies of Imam al Hussein, how? What, what was their goal? What did they want to do? To bury the message of Imam al Hussein. So the best revenge is to revive the message of Imam al Hussein. Then, number three, what does he say? Ala ya ahl al alam. إن جدي الحسين قتلوه عطشانا O people of the world My grandfather Hussein was killed thirsty Allahu Akbar You see the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi Begins by mourning on Abi Abdullah al-Hussein He will do that in Masjid al-Haram When he reappears Then what does he say? ألا يا أهل العالم إن جدي الحسين طرحوه عريانا O people of the world, know that my grandfather Hussein, he was, they even took his clothes from him. ألا يا أهل العالم إن جدي الحسين سحقوه عدوانا Oh people of the world, my grandfather Hussein, he was trampled. He was trampled, they crushed his bones and they crushed his body. He makes these five cries. The 313 companions are surrounding him. Then they gain power over Masjid al-Haram and over Mecca on that same night. Now what happens here? As Sufyani had sent an army to Medina, right? His army of 70,000 strong men are in Medina. When they hear Al-Mahdi has emerged, he sends them news, now immediately march from Medina. Go to Mecca and let's kill this Imam. Let's kill this Mahdi. 70,000 of the Sufyani soldiers, they march north, they march south towards Mecca. Now what happens is, when they reach an area called Al-Bayda, for those of you who have gone to, to the Hajj, you go from Medina, you go south to Mecca. After Masjid al-Shajara, you do your ihram at Masjid al-Shajara, after maybe about 20 kilometers, there is a flat land called Bayda. Once the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he stood on this land. You know what he said in one hadith? The Prophet stood on that land, he told his companions, my companions, on this land, the army of Sufyani shall be swallowed by the earth when they are marching to kill my grandson, the Mahdi. So 70,000 of these soldiers, they're in this land called Bayda. Allah dispatches Jibra'il. He splits the ground open, the ground swallows the Jaysh of Sufyani, the army of Sufyani, it's gone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets rid of them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives permission to Imam al-Mahdi to leave Mecca. Now at this time he had only 313 with him, but the hadith indicate that the Imam waits for his second circle of supporters, which is about 10,000 supporters. The Imam السلام, waits for them. About 10,000 supporters gather in Mecca. Then the Imam marches with them to where? To the city of Medina. He liberates the city of Medina from the remnants of Jaysh al-Sufyani who had stayed there to keep the city under their control. The Imam السلام, liberates the city of Medina. After he liberates the city of Medina, where does he go? He marches towards Iraq. He takes the same path as his grandfather Hussein. He goes to the land of Iraq because as Sufyani has had dispatched an army to Iraq. He goes to Kufa. Allah grants him victory, and he liberates Iraq. Now, up until this point, and this is very interesting, up until this point, you see that the outside world, the superpowers, they had not gotten involved yet. It's only in this region. And we hear about the Christians joining the Imam, right? The Christian world at the time, once they hear the message of the Imam, they will join him. When will they join him? 
The Imam السلام, after he liberates Iraq, he establishes his capital in the city of Kufa, the city of his grandfather Amir al Mu'mineen in that same masjid. That's the capital of his government. Then the Imam السلام, marches towards Palestine to liberate Palestine. Now here's where it gets tricky and complicated and you have this global war. Because once the Imam السلام, liberates Palestine, the superpowers of the time, they will be extremely upset. So they will dispatch their powers to now fight the Mahdi. Before that, the superpowers had not directly fought the Mahdi yet. It's after he liberates Palestine that they come to fight the Mahdi. Now what will happen here? The entire world is looking at the Mahdi, the superpowers of the world at the time, they will send their armies and all the weapons that they have to fight the Mahdi. When suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surprises the entire world and He sends down Isa ibn Maryam. Jesus son of Mary, that's when He comes down to the earth with 800 men and 400 women of His supporters. He comes down in Jerusalem. Now the whole world is watching. The Christians are watching. This is the person whom they thought was their Lord. They love Him, they follow Him. Jesus is coming, what is He going to do? Is He come to fight the Mahdi? Let's go with Jesus and fight the Mahdi. Excellent timing. When suddenly before all the lenses of the world at the time, I'm not sure what type of technology will exist at the time, but the whole world is seeing this second by second. They see the Jesus, peace be upon Him, coming down in Jerusalem, in Bayt al-Maqdis. He will come down. The Imam السلام, had just liberated Palestine, so he's also where? He's also in Palestine. Jesus السلام, walks up to Imam al-Mahdi. The world is anxiously walking, watching. What's happening? Is there going to be a war between Jesus and the Mahdi? When the time for the Adhan comes, and now... People want to pray. The Muslims want to pray, right? Who is going to be the leader? This hadith is from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He says, Oh my nation, how will you feel when this happens and Jesus comes and the time for salah comes and the Mahdi tells Jesus, do you want to lead the prayer? When Jesus will tell him, O oh son of Muhammad, you are the most rightful one to lead us. And Imam al-Mahdi stands in his salah, Allahu Akbar, and Jesus, son of Mary, will pray behind him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. At that point, once the Christian world sees Jesus behind the Mahdi, all the Christian nations, they will pledge their allegiance to the Imam of our time. And they will pressure their governments, because the governments have different agendas, they will pressure their governments to submit to the Imam salam. And you see the Christians will flock to join the movement of Jesus, peace be upon him, and the Mahdi. So this is a brief overview of the sequence of events how the Imam السلام, will emerge from Mecca and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow him to establish global justice. Now I leave you with one act that the Mahdi does when he goes to Iraq. One hadith says the Mahdi he goes to Kufa, he establishes his government, he takes Kufa as the capital, then he heads where? He goes north to Karbala. Imagine the sea. May Allah give us the honor of being on that journey with the Imam of our time. He marches towards Karbala. He goes to the shrine of his grandfather, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. He says, Assalamu alayka ya Jadda. Peace be upon you, O oh my grandfather. The hadith says, Al Imam al Hussein will answer him from his grave. وَعَلَيْكَ السَّلَامِ يَا وَلَدِي يَا مَهْدِي Peace be upon you, my dear son, my Mahdi. The hadith says, the Imam alayhi salam, he goes, 
he opens the grave of Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam and he takes a six month old baby from that grave. His head was severed and there's a three pronged spear in his head. He will hold the baby and then he will address his companions and he will say, Ashabi Madan Buhada Tif Hatta Yudbah Min Al Warid Il Al Warid Oh my companions, what was the sin of this baby such that they slaughtered him? All of his veins were slaughtered. What was the sin of this baby? Allahu Akbar. You see how the killing of Ali and al Azgar hurt the heart of Ahl al Bayt. Every Imam of Ahl al Bayt, our beloved Imam, he cries blood for Ali and al Azgar. When they remember the tragedy of this young infant and how he was mercilessly and ruthlessly killed. On such a night, we take our hearts to this six month old baby, Abdullah al Radi, or Ali al Azgar. His kunya, he had a title by the name of Abdullah. On the day of Ashura, Lady Sakina alayhi salam, she was experiencing extreme thirst. She went to the tents of Lady Zainab. She went there asking for Zainab to give her maybe some water if she has any water. That was her intention. Sakina says, I went to the tents to ask my aunt Zainab for some water when I saw her carrying my young brother Ali Azgar. And he had withered and she was trying to comfort him. He was, she was trying to quiet him because he was dying from thirst. She says, when I saw that scene, I felt embarrassed to ask her for any water. How can I ask for water when my own brother Ali Yin al Azgar is in that state? His mother Rabab, she could no longer breastfeed him. Due to the extreme thirst, she could no longer feed her own baby. Ali Yin al Azgar was withering, he was dying before their eyes. When Zainab and Sakina, peace be upon them, they call on Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Oh, Hussein, come here. See, look at your son, how he's withering from thirst. Can you try to go to these evil enemies and ask them for some water? Maybe they will give him some water. He's dying here in front of our own eyes. The Imam alayhi salam, he carries his baby in his arms. He goes out to the field, to the battlefield. Imagine many of his companions were killed at this point. Everyone was dead. This was the last young soldier left. <laughs> he carries the baby in his arm. He gives a powerful speech, but their heart is made of stone. What do you do with people when they have disease in their hearts and their hearts are made of stone? The Imam alayhi salam, he tells them, look, if you consider that I have made a sin, I have done something wrong in your eyes. If you see that, then what is the sin of this baby? Don't you see how he's withering, how he's dying, how he's dying from thirst? The Imam uses a word that is used to describe a fish. Have you seen when they take a fish outside the water? How it struggles? He says, don't you see how he's struggling? Like a fish that's taken outside the water from thirst? He's dying from thirst. Have mercy on him. In lam tarhamuni farhamu hadar radi. If you have no mercy on me, then have at least mercy on this baby. Some of them, some of those evil enemies, some of them temporarily their hearts softened, some of them cried, some of them said, yes, yeah, let's give him water. What's the harm? Just give the baby water. The Imam said, I can even leave the baby here. You feed him the water if you think I want the water for myself. The others, they said, no. There was a dispute in the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad realized that now there's a big controversy, there's big commotion. Some people are saying give water, some are saying no. This will demoralize his army. 
He wants them to be firm in fighting Al Imam Al Hussein. Oh believers, you know now what he did. He points to Haramala. Haramala was someone who knew the art of archery. He knew how to look at his target and with his spears and arrows he would strike very precisely. Umar ibn Sa'ad, he looks at Harmala, he tells him, Harmala, iqta' niza' al qawm. Harmala, don't you see the dispute here? End this dispute right now. Harmala, he, he tells him, I don't get it. What do you want me to do? He tells him, Do you not see the whiteness of the baby's neck? Allahu Akbar, what a ruthless heart. <laughs> Harmala, he takes out an arrow, oh believers, a three-pronged arrow, a three-headed arrow. He looks at the beautiful white small neck of Ali in al Azhar. He takes out the arrow and as the Imam is carrying the baby in his arms, asking them to give him some water, he takes the arrow, he shoots the arrow. Oh believers, the arrow comes landing on the neck. The narrations indicate he, he takes out his arms from the swaddle and he hugs his father. It's as if he's telling his father, Oh father, do you see how they gave me the water? Do you see? Do you see what they did to me? Allahu Akbar! The Imam alayhi salam, he takes his hands, the blood is now gushing from the neck of Ali al Azgar. The Imam, he takes his hand and he fills the blood with his hands. Then he takes the blood and he throws it into the sky and he says, Hawana ma nazala bi annahu bi'ayn Allah. He says, Oh Allah, the only reason that I am patient, what's making this easy for me is that you are the one who's watching. Because I am doing this for your sake, Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice. The Imam alayhi salam, according to some narrations, he takes Ali in al Azgar. He comes back towards the tent. But the Imam is now hesitant. What should he do? How should he give back this baby? They gave it to him alive. How is he going to give him to Zainab, to Sakina, to his mother Rabab? Some narrations indicate the Imam seven times back and forth. He would come, then he would go. He would come, then he would go. When narration says, Lady Sakina, she realizes something is wrong. There's movement outside the tents. She comes outside the tents. She sees the face of her father. Hussein narrations indicate the Imam salam after the killing of Ali al Azgar, his hair became even whiter. He became older. That's how difficult it was on his heart. Now Sakina realizes that the Imam, he was carrying something under his cloak. She tells him, Oh my father, what are you carrying under your cloak? The Imam walks up to her and, she, and he tells her, My beloved Sakina, take your brother Ali in al Azhar, see what they did to him. She sees Ali in al Azhar in that miserable situation. Lady Zainab comes. She sees Ali al Azhar, the woman and the children, they all begin to cry. But no one was hurt like his mother Rabah, my beloved son Ali. How many nights did I spend raising you? feeding you, caring for you. Now I see you in this state. Allahu Akbar, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayya'lamu alladhina zalamu ala muhammadin ayya munqalabin yanqalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Everyone raise your hands in dua. Many have asked, for our du'as. There's many brothers and sisters in this community, in other communities. They have a loved one who's sick, who's ill, who is suffering. This is the moment of du'a. You just heard the young brother in Manchester, in Birmingham, who was attacked. Let's also pray for his recovery. Let's pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
protects all of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt and all those innocent people around the world. May Allah protect all of these programs, especially tomorrow. There will be many enemies who cannot handle to hear the message of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, and they wish us ill. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to protect us on such a night, to protect us on the day of Ashura. Raise your hands in du'a, brothers and sisters. Everyone together recite this holy verse with me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suu. Amman. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء نسألك اللهم باسمك الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله تنت الله أبوان يا الله 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 اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمقاتلين بين يدي اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم اغني كل فقير اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب ومهموم اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة مسبوقة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد